Hello, and welcome to Stars, Cells, and God, the show where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science that have theological and philosophical implications, as well as new discoveries that point to the reality of God's existence. My name is Hugh Rost, and today I'll be your guide as we explore the topic of what Jim Painter, our visiting <laughs> scholar, has prepared for us. Uh, and Jim, I'm not going to actually give it. I want you to tease it for us. But before we get into the discussion, I wanted to encourage you to subscribe to our Reasons to Believe YouTube channel so you can be notified of our new weekly videos. You can learn more at reasons.org or by following us on social media at rtb underscore official. And yeah, I'll be talking about aqueous dinosaurs, but uh, Jim... First, tell us your qualifications and then uh, the topic that you want to discuss with us today. Well, Hugh, I am so happy to be here because the philosophy and the theology of reasons to believe, it just seems to be correct and I fit in perfectly and I love it. And I'm a little bit different. I'm not a molecular biologist or an astrophysicist. I'm a nutritionist. And so I've been doing that forever. It seems like, uh, I don't know, 40 years ago when I was in school, I got my undergraduate degree in nutrition, got a master's degree, got a PhD in nutrition, and I've been teaching it at the college level for, what, 35 years now. And I've worked as a consultant for a lot of different food companies that want to know about their products and how they work for the body. Mm -hmm. And so I've spent a lot of time working with a variety of companies. Very good. And uh, what's the topic you want to address today? The topic I'm going to talk about today, and uh, this is one we've heard a lot about, this is in Nutrients. It's the main uh, nutrition journal in my American uh, Nutrition Society. And it's the effects of intermittent fasting on brain health. And so, you know, people, this is brand new. This is about two months ago, I think, that this came out. And it's uh, by Broshi. And Broshi came up with a, a wonderful synopsis of this whole thing and how it all comes together. And they have a, one of the first figures they've put online, I think, for you to see. And... So I'm going to talk my way through this, and we're going to end up on the right side, which is brain health. But uh, the top of it just shows intermittent fasting. What is it? Well, you eat one day, and then you don't eat the next day, and you eat the next couple of days. And so you eat periodically. That's one kind of intermittent fasting. It's not the kind I recommend. And what I recommend is intermittently eating by just shrinking the hours in the day that you eat. Most people can do that better than just skipping a day. <laughs> this seems brutal to me, you know, to eat one day and eat nothing the next day and then eat one day. And so the way I suggest it is just to restrict the amount of time that you eat in a day. But it has on the left, and we'll talk our way through these things, it has all the things that it does for your body systemically. You know, we... So what you're talking about is rather than having, say, three or four square meals over an 18 or 16 hour <laughs> period of, of squishing it into something like eight hours. Is that what you're suggesting? Exactly right. Okay. Because some people eat all day long and I'm a little hungry before I go to bed at 10 o'clock, you have a sandwich, then you go to bed and you wake up in the morning. I think, well, what am I going to have for breakfast? And you eat, you gave your body eight hours to fast. And really, if you just flip it and you fast for 18 and give yourself eight to your body responds amazingly well to that longer period of time to clean house. So exactly right. Time-restricted fasting gives us just more time to do the things that we're going to talk about here. And so I always wondered, you know, fasting, I get it. I, my, my body changes. When I just don't eat, I'm going to fast for a day or two days. I really am different. You know, I'm hungry, and I can tell acetone's on my, on my breath, and something's happening. But I always wondered, can that happen in just the 18-hour period? And the evidence is out there now. It really does. So you get a little bit of the benefit of fasting every day. And I like eating that way. I actually feel good. Some people tell me, well, I'm hungry in the morning. Okay, well, eat in the morning and then quit by 4 in the afternoon. Well, then I'm hungry at night. Okay, we'll start at 12 and quit at 8. Well, then, then, I'm, then I'm hungry. And so I'm hungry sometime. And I say, well, tough. Just you're going to be hungry sometime. But it's for a short period of time. It's four hours where you, you're going to be hungry. And then you get to eat all you want. So this is all that happens if we do that. And I think God made this body resilient so that we can. There were going to be times where you don't have food. And so is the body made to go through those? Yes, it's designed to be able to do that. And so on this, we can see on the, on the left-hand side is insulin resistance. 
we, if we eat, 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 your body takes in sugar and it pumps out insulin and your blood sugar goes up and it goes down. And then you eat another meal, your blood sugar goes up and insulin comes out and you use that sugar and it goes. And so you can spend your whole day going through that and you've always got insulin there. Well, insulin is not just to get glucose into the cell. It regulates all kinds of other things. So you wonder why I can't get rid of this stubborn fat on my belly. It's because insulin is out there all the time telling your body, burn sugar, burn sugar. And if you get rid of the insulin for periods of time, your body will switch over and start burning the fat that you want to get rid of. And so the next thing on there is ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are so important. When you start burning fat, uh, you end up making ketone bodies for a variety of reasons we can't get into. But ketone bodies are a little short for carbons. So you break down glucose that's six carbons or the fat that's 16 or 18 carbons, and you, you break it down to these four carbons. And your body does amazing things with ketones. I used to think they just give you energy, which they do. And, and so you wonder, well, I, I haven't eaten sometimes, and, and sometimes you feel energetic when you haven't eaten. Well, your body isn't spending time digesting food. It's spending more time you know, using the foods you already ate to give you energy. So ketone bodies are so important it, for a variety of reasons. The, the first one is, is it kicks off a, a whole group of signals in your body to change what you're doing. So you're not taking in food, but your body needs energy. What's it going to do? And so what ketone bodies, ketone bodies do first is they, they kick off something called autophagy. Your body says, huh. No, they're not giving me any food. And all of a sudden, ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate, is what gives us energy. It's our energy molecule. And it starts going down. As ATP goes down and you've got the used adenosine monophosphate, that kicks in a variety of things. Ketones do this. They start, they start giving our body energy. And they also uh, start autophagy. And so autophagy is we start eating ourselves. Well, that sounds bad. Autophagy. I'm going to eat myself. Well, it depends what you're eating. <laughs> you know, if you're eating the bad parts, I give you the example of you go into a grocery store and they take the food out of the boxes, put it on the shelf, and just leave the boxes, leave the boxes. So you go in there and you've got to figure out where the food is behind the box. And you've got all this junk and you're, you're, you know, going through the trash just to get to the food. Well, our bodies are like that too. We don't do things perfectly. So we, we make proteins and they're misshapen. I mean, proteins are these huge, complex arrangements of amino acids with different pieces of nutrients in there, minerals, that make them make the exact right shape so they work. All right, so those things are just, they happen, they don't happen right. So you've got all these broken, mismade pieces of stuff floating around in the cell. And so your body thing can go in there, and you've got mitochondria that give you energy. They make energy, and they get old. They get worn out, and, and they're, they're there. And so what your body does is inside of every cell, the trillions of cells that you have, as soon as you stop eating, within about 12 hours, it's, this starts kicking in. And your body starts making these autophagosomes, and they start engulfing broken pieces in the cell. And what do they do with it then? Then a lysosome attaches and breaks down all of that stuff that's in the cell, and it breaks open. And instead of broken proteins, fats, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, you have all the building blocks. You have amino acids, you have sugars, you have fats, and you've got nucleic acids that your body can use. And it just breaks open. So it cleans up the trash that's in you. It, it breaks all those bonds and uses that for energy. And then it gives you all the pieces, the original pieces that you can start building things. And I think, what an amazing body that God made to be able to do this. So when you look at this slide again, you can see there's so many things to talk about. We're going to skip most of them because we're talking about systemic effects on the left. And that has the ketone bodies, the ghrelin. Um, and we're just talking about the bottom now, restructuring of the gut microbiome. It's but good. just to make it clear, Jim, what yeah. you're saying is we're not talking about caloric restriction. No. You're going to get the calories you need. Right. You just concentrate them into smaller time periods. Right. And uh, you need those long periods where your body is not trying to process food right. to basically clean house. Exactly. And uh, there's benefits to allowing your body to clean house on a regular basis. <laughs> and so can right. you review for us, uh, for lay people, what exactly are those benefits? So the many benefits you get, so if you just keep putting food in, your body 
has to expend a lot of energy digesting it. So you've got these proteins and these fats that your its body takes a lot of energy just to to digest them, to break them down, to assimilate them, to transfer them when they need to be. So to be specific, that's energy you can't devote to other purposes. Exactly right. I mean, I'll give you an example. Yeah. I mean, you know, I do a lot of research and writing, and when I'm in a really intense research mode, I'm so focused I don't eat. <laughs> but basically all the energy in my body is going towards that mental exercise. Right. And, you know, people who know me, I love hiking and mountaineering, but I've been doing a really challenging hike. Uh, I don't eat. Right. I'm focusing on trying to get to, I know I'm going to eat after it's all <laughs> over. And so it's okay for me to go 12, 14, 16 hours without eating because I know food's going to be at the end. But it means I can use all that energy to get into the top of the mountain. Or I can use all that energy to actually understanding what's in this set of research journals. And so... Uh, whereas I'm eating food all the time, that's energy that's being devoted to other purposes. Do I have it right? <laughs> you know, that's exactly right. When, when I give a talk, no matter when it is in the day, I never eat before that. People go, what? Yeah, if it's 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, I don't eat before that because I notice that when I eat a big meal Thanksgiving, you have this bunch of food, all your blood's going there. It's leaving your head. I mean, it's still there, but the concentration is in your guts trying to digest, absorb, assimilate all that that food, and you get goofy. You and get sleepy. tired. You yeah. get sleepy. You know, <laughs> after Thanksgiving, everybody's in a coma laying around the house <laughs> watching football or whatever. And it really, you only have so much energy, and you've got to keep the energy where you need it. So if you're hiking a mountain, you want it in your muscles. Right. And you don't need it in your head thinking. You're just trying to get to the point where you want to be. So that's very true. And we think about that, ah, oh, I'm sick. I need to get more energy. Well, when you're sick sometimes, that's not the time to pile your body with food because your body's spending on a huge amount of energy fighting that infection. Right. And so it's best to go with the reserves you have. Don't I need to eat? I need this. No, really. You don't need to eat much when you're sick. You need to let your body fight that infection and not spend the energy digesting the food. Very good point. Yeah. And if you lose a couple of pounds, you're going to get it back. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Most people are not worried about losing a couple of pounds. They're going, yes, I lost some pounds. <laughs> That's a tough way to do it, to get sick, but you do. Yeah. Okay. So that's us. But then in addition to this, on that diagram we were looking at the bottom left, it was talking about the microbiome. The bacteria are just like us. They need to eat, and they need to rest and relax. <laughs> and so when we give our GI tract time when we're not putting food in, for some reason, the bad bacteria, all the pathogenic things, need to eat, 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 eat. And then if we don't eat for a while, it tends to knock down the level of the pathogenic bacteria that are in there. And they're always there. It's a balance. Life is such an amazing balance. You can't just do one thing. We were talking yesterday, and you were talking about vitamin C. Should I take a lot, a lot of vitamin C? Well, no, not really, because, you know, you need so much. Without enough, you're deficient. With too much, it becomes toxic, and you don't need that. And so there's times when you do and times when you don't. There's ebbs and flows of life. And so... When you don't eat, it restructures your microbiome. The good bacteria have a better chance of surviving on those periods of fasting. It is just quite amazing how that works to help your microbiome. And then once you do that, this amazing relationship that we have with the bugs in our body. You know when Pasteur came along and said, the germ theory and germs are killing us. Oh, my goodness. And so germs became the enemy, which they were. You know, and there are some that are enemies that we try to get rid of. But at that time, we didn't realize at all that we're covered with germs. We're covered with all kinds of stuff and in our intestines. And not only are they there, but we work together with them. You put our bodies in a sterile environment and they don't work because the bacteria in there are actually creating things that we need. When I first heard that, I couldn't believe it. I know. So you've got serotonin in your brain. It's the happy, feel good. Uh, and, and so it's a great neurotransmitter. And I was thinking it was always made up here. It's where it, com- this is where it works. It must come from there. And when I found this out, I had to read it 100 times before I actually believed it, that you get most of the serotonin. It's like 80% of the serotonin that we have in our brains that we use in our body are made in our intestine. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Yes. All those good uh, neurotransmitters that we need in our brain are made in our intestine. 
that's incredible. People call it the second brain because there's so many nerve endings coming right, into our right. intestine. It's just it's just a massive amount. It's just the web of nerve endings around our GI tract, and the bugs uh, communicate with our intestine, and they give certain nutrients like serotonin, and then. Uh, really, the really short chain uh, butyric acid that, that comes uh, through breaking down fiber. Fiber is so important, but we can't use it. Yeah, but our gut microbiome uses it. So we don't eat the fiber for us. We eat it for them. They break it down, and their byproduct is butyric acid. And lo and behold, who would have guessed our intestinal lining uses butyric acid for energy? <laughs> and so the fiber we can't use goes down there, the bugs eat it, they produce the butyric acid, and it makes us satiated sometimes 15 hours after we eat because we're getting all of that from the microbiome. So it's incredible. That's the general thing of health. But specifically on the right-hand side of this diagram, uh, when they show it, shows what it does specifically for the brain. And that's the fascinating part. You look at these skinny little neurons. They don't have fat cells in there, and they don't have a lot of stored uh, energy, glucose. They don't, so, so you need that coming in all the time to these neurons. And the neurons run really well on these four uh, carbon uh, ketones. And, and it just burns them for energy. Sometimes really better than sugar. Because a lot of these neurogenerative diseases that we are looking at now are sugar problems. They are. Yeah. People are calling... <laughs> Alzheimer's, like type 3 diabetes, diabetes yes. of the brain. Because, yeah, you, you get so much sugar in there and you have the insulin problem with too much sugar. And if you calm all that down by not giving it a bunch of sugar, your brain burns ketones. I think that's amazing to me that when I don't eat, I think clearly. I've always felt that way. I might be hungry and my stomach might be growling, but my brain is sharper you know, when I'm fasting, especially the second day, if I'm on a three-day fast or something, and I really don't suggest people try and fast 40 days like Jesus did. You know, <laughs> it was a special situation there, or being in the desert. And so, but a couple of day fast, I noticed that I, my, I'm sharper. I think clearer. And if you think about that, if we're hunter-gatherers out there trying to uh, hunt down a, uh, a buffalo and we haven't eaten for a day or two days, well, isn't it nice that our brain gets sharper so that we can be able to hunt and gather better when we haven't eaten. Okay, so we're hungry. People have to get past the idea, oh, I'm hungry, I have to eat. Well, not necessarily enjoy it for about 10 minutes before you eat, you know, and, and don't always be trying to fix hunger every moment. I, well, I can't be hungry. Why not? But why can't you be hungry, you know? <laughs> you know that you're going to get to eat later. It's not like, we. am I ever going to get to eat again? Yeah, you will in four hours. You'll eat. So... When I look at this for the brain, I was told in college, you know, before I was a believer and I was pledging for fraternity, you drink, 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 and then you puke, 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 and you do that two weeks, and I thought, this is stupid. I'm not even a believer, and I thought, this is stupid. And they said, you're killing brain cells. You'll never get them back. <gasps> How many brain cells did I kill? You know, what did I, what did I do to myself? <laughs> and uh, this is fairly new in the last 10 years or so. We didn't really know about this 30, 40 years ago. And so... Your, your brain actually can build new brain cells. Oh, I was lied to in college. You know, <laughs> they said you'll never get them back. It's called neuroplasticity. Our brain does change. It's plastic. It reforms. And one of the things it does, it has a variety of growth factors. And this little chart shows a couple of them, BDNF. The uh, growth factor 2 is in there. And that reduces neuroinflammation so it can grow. You make more brain cells. When I first heard that, I thought, what a lovely idea, you know? Are we doomed to Alzheimer's and dementia? Can you even work with your brain at that point? Yeah, if you treat it right, you can do a lot of things to help your brain, even if it's going and having problems. You can build new things. So I love BDNF, and that also keys off of ketones. Ketones start a whole variety of cascade of things, and one of them is autophagy. And when you're into autophagy, you're making more BDNF. So I look at these chemicals that are on there, and I think, that's amazing. It reduces inflammation. Ha, ah, inflammation, that's bad. No, inflammation keeps you alive if you poke yourself with something and you get an infection. Without inflammation, you're dead from a little poke with a twig. 
you know, or if you have a, a germ, uh, if it's there, your body needs to gear up strong as it can, and, and you inflame, you swell, all these cytokines go in there, and, and they attack that, that invader. And so it's good, but it's not good if it's going all the time, and that's what we have now. And so what's causing neuroinflammation and inflammation in the body in general, generally it's, it's what we eat and it's the way we think. <laughs> and so we talk about body, mind, and spirit because if we're nervous, we're worried, we're anxious, that creates an environment in our body of, of trying to fix something. And, it's, and it gears up lots of things we don't want. This inflammation kind of builds up throughout your body. When you fast your body actually starts calming down all of this inflammatory process. Again, you're not wasting energy. That's energy. Inflammation is energy. You're, you're putting energy to attack that invader, but there's no invader. It's in your mind. You're worried. You're anxious. You ate a bunch of sugar and Twinkies, and all your body got was sugar, and your body's going, wait a minute. I, I, this is great. I like sugar, but I don't have all the nutrients to process it. And it's, it's, it's clogging up because I can't process the food that I ate. And so I love this, too, that when you just don't eat <laughs> for a period of time, all of these good things happen in your body to help you not just clean house, but to put the energy where your body needs the energy. Okay, I know what our viewers are going to want. What's the minimum time <laughs> I need to fast to get all these amazing benefits? <laughs> you know, and so I've read a number of really great articles that actually showed, you know, you eat, your blood sugar goes up, blood sugar goes up, blood sugar goes up at 10 at night. And then in the morning, you eat again, blood sugar goes up, blood sugar goes And then look at the ketone bodies. Your body doesn't make any. So I was wondering, when do you start making it? Well, you have to start depleting the glycogen, the stored sugar that's in your body is glycogen. You have to deplete that store, especially in your liver. And it looks like if you go 12 hours, that does it. But if you think of most Americans, we eat at 8 at night, uh, 10 at night, and then we get up and eat at 7 or 8 in the morning, we don't even have 12 hours. Don't even 12 hours, So right. we're talking about just changing it a little bit where you get the extra four hours, you know, going for 16 to 18 hours of not eating. That last two or three hours, your body starts flipping its metabolism and starts making these ketone bodies, and you get a tiny bit of the benefit of fasting every day. Okay, well, I've read articles saying you have to go at least 16 hours in a fast to get benefits but you're saying you actually get some benefits even if it's only 12 hours. And it depends on the body. It depends yeah. on how well you store it. But the this research I've written, read is that really after 12 hours, so if I eat um, today at 6 and I don't eat tomorrow at 6, then if I look at that 6 to 12 or 6 to 10, over those hours, by the third and the fourth hour, your body is really, you'll know because you're hungry. Your body's looking for more food. And so those last couple hours, you start actually making ketone bodies because you're breaking down fat. And as soon as you start breaking down fat, you make the ketone bodies. So what you're telling me is when you start feeling that sense of hunger, that's when the ketone production kicks in. That's probably a very good analogy. And so when you get hungry, you go, yes, I'm losing weight. <laughs> yeah, you know, yes, my brain is building. Yes, I'm getting Or if healthier. you don't need to lose weight, yes, I'm making ketones. <laughs> that's right. Yes, I'm making <laughs> ketones. And my brain is building itself. It, yeah. it is an odd thing in, in our country. It's not in every country that I've been that we're so geared into uh, making sure we don't have a hunger pain. And sometimes we've forgotten about hunger. It doesn't matter. I eat at night because I do. And I, when I get up in the morning, I want to eat then too. And so when I see people that are 300, 400, 500 pounds, to be able to maintain that weight, you have to eat all the time. You have, people say, I don't eat very much. Well, that's almost impossible. You know, maybe there's a case out there that's really that way. But to maintain that weight, you've got to be sipping on Coke and, and eating something and putting something in your mouth all the time to just maintain it. So that's an issue. If you're that overweight, then, uh, hey, are you eating all the time? You have to be. You really no, I really don't eat all the time. You really have to be. You you to get that many calories in there, uh, to keep that weight on, you have to be eating a lot and often. Okay. Well we're talking about the physical benefits of fasting. Do you want to address for a moment some of the spiritual benefits? You know, as I look at uh, Isaiah fifty eight, the spiritual benefits of fasting and, and really I don't think God ever thought, hmm, I'm gonna have them fast to make them physically better. That's not what it talks about in the scripture. Fasting, if you're mourning, you're fasting. Well, your body just does it anyway. If someone near to you dies, oh, you don't want to eat. 
you naturally go into fasting. Or if they're going to take Paul and Barnabas and they're going to send them off, you fast because you want to make sure that you're in touch with God and you're not messing around with all this natural stuff. And saying no to food helps you focus better on, am I really following him? And then they'll send them off. They'll pray. So there's a number of reasons why fasting is talked about in the Bible. And all this nutrition stuff is kind of like, is it really scientific and is it good for you? Would God do this thing that helps us here, but it hurts us over here? No. It's another thing that t to me shows the wisdom of God and that this is a designed body because it does numerous things. And so when I think about fasting and I'm reading through Isaiah 58, it says, don't fast to be noticed by me. You're thinking you're doing this so that you're going to get a hold of, get my attention. It's not, it doesn't change God. It doesn't make him, oh, look at you, Jim. You're such a good boy. You're fasting and denying your body. I'm going to give you this. You know, just that, that's not the real. I thought about that when I first started fasting decades ago. Well, I'll fast and I'll prove to God that I'm worthy to get what I want here. <laughs> and it's and I look at the script. Doesn't say that at all in the scripture. That's not what it is. Yeah. Well, maybe you. I mean, when we started Reasons to Believe 37 years ago, we launched it with quarterly days of prayer and fasting. We've been doing that routinely. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, but the whole principle is, yeah, we're not trying to please God, but if we don't consume food, our brains are going to be able to focus more mm -hmm. on what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Uh, we're going to be able to in, you know, take all the energy of the body and put it towards this one spiritual goal. And one thing we've noticed consistently, our prayers are not only more meaningful, they're more effective. We see God doing miraculous things because we're basically focusing 100% of our energy and attention on one goal, prayer. And if you read the scriptures, prayer is the most powerful tool that God has given to us human beings. Right. It's the one thing where God has put restrictions on it. Don't pray this way. Don't pray this way. It's such a very powerful tool that God has said, be careful how you use it. Yeah. But it's such a powerful tool, God wants us to use it more often than we do. And if you're eating all the time, you're not praying that much. I mean, we pray before meals, right? right. But typically, it's what, 30 seconds, 60 <laughs> seconds? Yeah. Uh, and Scripture tells us, I want you, my followers in Jesus Christ, to have extended times of prayer where you're really focusing on your relationship with me. And that's what fasting does for us. And uh, what you're sharing with us, hey, uh, if you don't have the time to go 24 hours in a fast, at least go 16 hours. Yeah. And if you go 16 hours, you're going to get all these physical benefits as well as all these spiritual benefits. And hey, isn't Jesus Christ the most important person in your life? Shouldn't you be spending some regular time with him? So put aside all your work for the Lord, quote, work for the Lord, <laughs> right. and actually communicate with him. <laughs> and also the thing I've noticed, too, that when we have our days of prayer and fasting, uh, we have to discipline ourselves. Let's not talk to God all the time. Mm -hmm. Let's have periods of quiet where we listen to God. It's a two-way relationship. Right. And so often I see Christians in America, especially when they're praying, they're doing all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yang Gi Cho was talking about that once, who is a minister from Korea. And he said, when I have, you know, American pastors over here say, okay, we're going to be quiet and we're going to listen to God. And he says, Within about a few minutes, all these American pastors are just kind of looking around what they're supposed to do <laughs> because they're not used to being quiet before God and listening. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I guess to, to wrap this thing up with, uh, with fasting is and when you're talking about eating too, God says, whatever I do, whatever I eat, whatever I drink, whatever I do, do all to the glory of God. And I just think, you know, when, even when you're eating, to do it for God, to think about that when you're eating, to take into some consideration when you're looking at this menu at the restaurant thinking, what do I want to eat? What's going to be pleasant to my tongue, my taste buds? What is it that I want? Also consider that scripture, do all to the glory of God. God, is there something you want to say about what I'm putting into my body now to fuel it? And you know, I'm not against junk food. Really, I, if people want to eat that, it is food. It's not the best thing. You shouldn't do it all the time. Once in a while, if you do it, it's fine. But if you're always three meals a day, you're always thinking about what I want, what tastes good to me, and you never take into consideration the, the idea that God made this system 
for you to live and to survive. And if you don't eat the right foods, you don't get the right nutrients, and you just don't get enough to be able to make your body function. And so I, I think of that all the time. What do you want to eat? What do you want to eat? Little Johnny, what do you want to eat? Like you go to a restaurant, what do you want to eat? And so much of it is what I want, what I want, what I want. All right, a little bit of, hmm, what's the best thing for me to eat? What does God want me to eat? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what should I be eating here? God, do you have an opinion about this, about what I should be eating? Yeah, he's got an opinion. <laughs> it's in the scriptures, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, very good. Okay. Well, I got a little discovery I want to talk about, and it has to do with dinosaurs. So we're going way back in time when the dinosaurs Everybody were Everybody loves dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. So yeah. They're, they're big creatures. And uh, this paper got published in Nature uh, recently, uh, Subaqueous Forging Among Carnivorous Dinosaurs. And uh, you know, even children who uh, are into dinosaurs realize it was a time in Earth's history when the continents had these huge shallow seas. Yeah. And so like North America, for example, uh, was covered to a high percentage with these shallow uh, water seas. And uh, we call them seas, but they're really fresh water. Uh, and when we call them seas, we realize they're quite shallow. We're talking like 10, 30 feet deep. Uh, but that explains why we had dinosaurs during the Cretaceous, mm. the Jurassic, and the Triassic. That was a unique time in Earth's history when the continents of the world were covered by these huge, really shallow uh, water environments. And that water enabled God, the creator, to make really big uh, animals because the water provided buoyancy. I mean, without water buoyancy, the largest land animal you can have would be like the elephant. And you notice the elephant's got these four huge limbs. Yeah. Uh, it's all designed in order to have maximum body weight. And if you make the elephant any bigger, uh, because of the force of gravity, it's going to injure itself and it's mm. not going to live as long. So it's at the very high limit of what the laws of physics will permit. But if you've got water buoyancy, you're going to mm. have a much larger animal. I mean, give an obvious modern-day example. Think of the blue whale. Uh, comes in at a maximum of 200 tons. <laughs> uh, it's 100 feet long, but uh, it's sitting in water, and the water provides the buoyancy to m permit a body that size. Well, uh, during the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous era, uh, it was possible for the creator to make these really big dinosaurs because they could take advantage of their water environment to provide them with the buoyancy. And, uh, you know, Paleontologists have had evidence for a long time that there were herbivorous uh, dinosaurs, 80 tons mm. and uh, you know, 80 feet long, uh, taking advantage of the shallow water environment. What this paper is pointing out, it wasn't just the herbivores, there were carnivores there as well. And uh, you know, somebody was taking care of the large herbivorous population. So it makes sense that uh, there would be these carnivores there. But it's also making the point that they took advantage of the water and not only provide them with buoyancy, they were foraging on creatures that were on the bottom of these shallow seas. And so, you know, with their long necks and their big mouths, uh, they were able to dip into the water, kind of like what a moose does. You ever watch a moose? <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, they love to forage in these lakes and they feed on the uh, plant life that's at the bottom of the lake. And they're well designed for that. They've got long legs, long necks, a huge head, and uh, they're very efficient hmm. at taking advantage of that. Well, they've actually found some fossil evidence basically making the point, hey, this wasn't a rare phenomenon. I mean, that's been in the published scientific literature for a few decades, that there were a few of these carnivorous dinosaurs living in the shallow seas and foraging on animals that were crawling around at the bottom of these seas. But what this article is pointing out, they weren't rare. Hmm. We now have the fossil evidence uh, that they were a significant part of the ecosystem. There were many of them, many different species, and significant populations of them. And this is what we would expect from a creation perspective, is what you see in Psalm 104 is that God creates life with the maximum biodiversity, the maximum biomass. You know, Psalm 104, the longest of the creation psalms in the Bible, 
basically says no matter where you go on planet Earth, you're going to find God's creation. Mm. You're going to find the animals and the plants that he's created. Go to the highest mountains, it's there. Go to the bottom of the sea, mm. it's there. It's everywhere. Mm. Basically laying out the principle that God has designed our planet uh, to be able to accommodate a tremendous biodiversity and a huge biomass. And God is committed to sustain that throughout the whole history of life on planet Earth. And you know, from a 21st century perspective, we can see that we're the beneficiaries of that. We're the last life forms to come upon the terrestrial scene. Right. But we have the benefit of all the biodeposits laid down by these uh, billions of years of life that preceded us. So people say, well, what benefit do we get from the dinosaurs? Well, I remember watching a cartoon <laughs> once and it showed this dinosaur psychiatrist interviewing this other dinosaur sitting on a, on a couch. And the one on the couch says, uh, Doctor, I keep having these repetitive dreams and they're highly symbolic. And the psychiatrist dinosaur says, well, tell me, what's the symbol? And it was WD-40. <laughs> <laughs> and so not that we get all of our oil from yeah. dinosaurs. We only get a small amount, but they right. do contribute to the biodeposits. And so God is committed, no matter what the natural environment of the earth is, to ensure that it has the maximum biomass and the maximum biodiversity. So we shouldn't be surprised that when the earth has these big shallow seas, the creator steps in and says, you know what? I'm going to create animals and plants so that it has the greatest biodiversity and the greatest uh, biomass in such a way that when I create these future human beings, they're going to have all the resources, mm -hmm. biodeposit resources they need to launch and sustain civilization. So I was excited about this uh, paper in the sense, hey, this is another confirmation of the wisdom we see in the creation psalms, especially uh, Psalm uh, 104. So, you know, as I was reading through the paper, I was surprised at how they found out that they're aquatic. Yes. You know, and looking at the bone structure, and I think, well, that makes sense. You wouldn't have a bird with bones like an elephant. And I never thought about that with aquatic. Well, okay, because they're kind of like a bird. They're, they don't need the structure to hold them up. Um, and so their bones can be different. And so that was a fascinating part of the article that you, you could no, tell. No, I really that. liked that too, how they basically discover they have to be aquatic. Yeah. They have to be carnivorous. They have to be feeding on these animals at the bottom of uh, these shallow seas because of their unique bone density. Yeah. Their bone density was optimized for that particular behavior. And so uh, that was their comment is, okay, we've had a limited amount of fossil evidence that these carnivorous dinosaurs may have existed, but they would have been rare. But say, if we look at the bone density, not just the fossils, but the bone density, this tells us, hey, that they're optimally designed for this behavior, and hey, they were abundant, they weren't rare. So, yeah, paleontology needs to take a step forward, examine the bone densities. Because uh, as you pointed out, uh, whether they're flying in the air, or they're on the land, or they're in the water, you're going to get different optimal bone densities uh, for the environment in which they live. Right. So thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah, I got excited about that too. Yeah. So, and the paper's online. It's in the British Journal Nature. And, uh, you know, if you're with a particular institution, you can get it for free. Uh, but I'll give you a tip. And that is that uh, if you go to the archive site, it's arxiv.org, uh, that's where you find the preprints. And it won't be exactly like the peer-reviewed paper, but if it did get published, it'll be close. And guess what? You can read the uh, preprints for free, the entire paper. You know what? In all my time, and I never knew that, <laughs> that existed. Now, I have a libraries at the universities I'm at that give me almost anything I can dream of. Right. But uh, that would be handy if you don't have access to... Uh, well, for lay uh, people, if you don't yeah. have access to that... And you can go to sites like PubMed. Uh, PubMed uh, makes available for you an archive, a, an exhaustive archive yeah. of all the life science papers. And you can go to the NASA website at Harvard University, adswww.harvard.edu. That's where you find something like PubMed, but it's for the physical sciences. So you can go there. The abstracts are always free for everybody. Yeah. 
and typically PubMed and uh, uh, the NASA website, they'll not only give you a link to the peer-reviewed paper, they'll give you a link uh, to the preprint. Mm. And you can go to the preprint and you can read the whole thing for free. Very so good. you don't have to pay the 30 bucks a paper. Yeah, uh, or pretty steep. Or join a university and join their adjunct faculty to get that access. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us today on Stars, Cells, and God. Join the discussion in the comments below. Remember to like this video and to subscribe for more content. New episodes of Stars, Cells, and God release each Thursday and are available here on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Be sure to share this video with a friend and remember... The more we know about science, the more reasons we have to believe in Jesus Christ as creator, Lord, and Savior.